Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, July 9th, 2022. It's been another great week of shows with great topics, great guests. And we kicked off the week with a look at how active mutual funds matched up with their index or passive peers. Let's take a look. An active fund is one that has uh, a manager or managers uh, who are trying to select uh, uh, securities, either stocks or bonds, that they, they believe will be superior to other securities in the same category. So it's, uh, you could call it a guessing game, uh, you could call it a game of skill, uh, but the, the, our topic is really that uh, it's very difficult to demonstrate skill, and the better way to win the game is to play by the odds and and reduce your costs. Index funds uh, uh, on an average will beat a managed fund about 80% of the time. So you, your chance of picking a winning fund uh, runs from one in five to maybe one in 10. For, you know, for instance, among bond funds, uh, only about 10%, sometimes less, will beat an index over any period of time. And the longer your period of time, the lower your chance that uh, a manager will, will win. And of course, the longer the period of time, the greater the chance that the fund will disappear or that the manager will change and you basically start your probability game all over. And uh, that's why it's kind of a fool's game. Uh, but the, what we face is this onslaught of uh, people who sound very good, who tell us that they see this and that in the future. Uh, and we unfortunately tend to believe them. But, you know, those are the messages we get that are, uh, uh, imagine that you're, you're taking driving lessons. You've never driven before. And your instructor tells you to watch the hood of the car closely. That's the equivalent of what we have in everything that we see on the media. You know, when we see the talking heads in the morning, uh, uh, when we, we read the reports, it's saying, wow, look what happened to, at just ahead of the hood. Uh, and it's misleading because we have to invest over a long period of time for, you know, basically for our whole lives, starting at whatever time we can scrape together our first dime to save. The managers, uh, however smart they are, however well-informed they are, they cannot outrun the disadvantage of their costs. And in fact, uh, the, the reason I got into looking at this is I started examining that difference. And I found that the odds, this is long before Spiva started, uh, the odds of getting a winning fund uh, increased with lower costs. The higher the cost of the fund, in other words, you're paying for good management here, uh, is BS. Well, I, but this is where the managers will say, this is the time to own individual stocks. This is the time to be very careful about your fixed income holdings. And, uh, but when the statistics come out, what we generally find is that, oh my, the, the managed funds didn't do, they didn't do what they said they would do. They, they had too much cash. They didn't have enough cash. They sold at the wrong time. They bought at the wrong time. Uh, so they're doing what they usually do, uh, which is not produce winning results on, on, on average. And, and then on, on a consistent matter, basis. Yeah, on a consistent basis. And then it becomes a matter of, of okay, for you and me, uh, what, is, what are the odds that we'll, in this panorama of funds, what are the odds that we will be able to pick one of the winners? And it's basically, you know, very poor choices. You know, we yeah. not a good chance. Next up, we discussed charitable giving in 2021, but inflation looms. Let's take a look. Yeah, absolutely. Charity has really been wonderful. It's a, 
Um, it hit the record number. We've never seen a number like this before, 484.85 billion. So nearly wow. half a trillion in giving. And the number starts over at zero every year. So that means there was almost half a trillion in new gifts just in 2021. Now that number is the highest number we've ever reported. But to be completely honest, I must say inflation uh, went up 4.7% and giving was 4% higher. So if you adjust for inflation, you might it might be the second best year, but still, uh, we're in a really peak moment of philanthropy in the United States. Uh, in fact, in the United States right now, you could say about three fourths of giving is actually from individuals. So it's slightly under 70% in terms of outright cash gifts from individuals. But if you include charitable bequests, which are very generous gifts after a person's lifetime uh, included with that number, it's about 76%. Uh, the other quarter is foundation and corporate giving of which corporate giving went up quite a bit in 2021. We saw a big jump off of 2020 into 2021. Um, and it grew probably in one of the biggest spikes that we've seen. But similar to the inflation rate, their profits grew even more so. I'd say in the last 18 years, we've seen a slow decline in the percent of pre-tax profits given by corporations. About um, 18 years ago, you could count on for the decade before about 1% of pre-tax profits given to uh, nonprofits and to charities. Now it's about 0.7%. Now it's a small, I mean, a number like that, but if you think of it, it's a third less as a share of how much uh, they're making, but the individual number keeps climbing People are being very generous, and it's across the board. Uh, while we see a lot of big gifts, it's really we've seen some record participation in things like Giving Days and Giving Tuesdays. So it's, a, it's really a, a, a cultural phenomenon, I think. Over the history of the United States, and as we've been keeping track of these numbers for 60 plus years in the United States through the Giving USA publication, and religion has been the top uh, recipient of charity, but that's slowly been ticking down. Education is probably growing uh, as that ticks down as the, the second biggest, uh, uh, clearly. But we've seen a lot of kind of moving around re really with the pandemic. The arts were really struggling in 2020, but they had a big spike in 2021. So people are like, we, we believe in the arts. So we I think that's an important value and it's not uncommon when times are tough people give to survivor type issues like a maslow's hierarchy we need to eat we need to have shelter so public society benefit and human services benefit in times of hardship when times are are a little bit better and money's flowing like 2021 honestly the market was pretty good um there was a high savings rate uh there was some discretionary income during 2021 now not for everybody but some people you start to see more self-actualized things that are important values such as the arts and education um and research uh, climbing so we did see a big jump in in the in the arts uh environment has had two years of consecutive giving that's been a very important charity to many and it's uh it's probably not where some hope it would be but it's continuing to grow as a charitable uh, value for many probably the most consecutive um, and consistent growth we're seeing is though to public society benefit and to foundations themselves. And a lot of that phenomenon is tied up with the donor advised fund concept where people are giving in, into donor advised funds to some would say stall their charitable decision. They make the charitable gift now so that they can make an informed choice later. And there's been a tremendous growth and rise in that, um, in that field uh, in, in 2021. I like to say the spirit of generosity is recession proof. I only wish the amount was. And that might be a good way of, of describing it. The reason 2021 was really good is because we had a strong stock market, GDP was up, we saw savings rates, discretionary income was up, uh, corporate pre-tax profits. Now, all of those things that were contributors to 2021 being up are things that are subject to inflation bringing them back down. So there, so there does, uh, there is expected that some of those other indicators will bring the charitable number down. However, we've seen in the past, I, I want to say 1988, 89, we saw a 4% inflation rate and giving still went up. So people still give. Now, will the amounts be affected? Possibly. Um, it probably has shifted some thinking where we're seeing perhaps the most um, impact is on the smaller level gifts, those that are individuals that give out of their income, they work for a living, they give some portion to the charities that they find important uh, versus donors that are increasingly giving out of assets. Like once people retire, they're living out of assets. Uh, maybe they're um, they have asset wealth. People that give out of asset wealth tend to be more recession proof as well as inflation proof, but that's just uh, tendencies. Uh, uh, there's also in, in addition to the numbers, just your own 
feelings about things. If you're feeling uncertain, you don't know what the economy in the future is, are you as ready to make a big gift? Um, perhaps more importantly, are you willing to make a multi-year pledge like to a campaign? You might be like, oh, I might give you a gift this year, but am I willing to make a five-year pledge? Not so sure. So you sometimes see a pullback on multi-year commitments. Well, we're halfway through. We come back. The other half of our best segments for the week, you're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We wanna make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. Next up, we discussed how you can half your risk for dementia and other cognitive diseases. Let's take a look. So a great place to start when thinking about healthy lifestyle changes is really through the American Heart Association's Life Simple 7, which is, uh, which is focused around cardiovascular health. But again, when you think about it more broadly, it really is a full body approach. And this is what the forum has really been focusing on over the last few weeks. And these seven changes include um, regular exercises, keeping a healthy diet, remaining smoke-free, maintaining a healthy weight, maintaining a healthy blood pressure, having healthy cholesterol levels, and uh, reducing your blood sugar. And how this ties back to dementia is a recent study from the American Academy of Neurology tied this by following almost 12,000 people for 30 years and scoring them on how closely they followed these guidelines and found that even those who had a genetic predisposition reduced their, ch their chances of developing dementia by about 43% which is really quite significant. And what I find especially interesting as well is there's other bodies of research out there that has showcased that even if someone doesn't tackle all of these factors, they still can lower their risk by, uh, by picking a few. And while again, this is not at all conclusive, uh, there is research out there that suggests that the incidence of dementia in Europe and North America has fallen by about 15% over the last 30 years. And this is likely due to lifestyle changes such as a decrease in smoking. So even though the, the incidents are falling, um, again, we still remain, we still have the challenge of uh, individuals that are 
diagnosed with dementia living a bit longer. And so, again, as you said, it's really critical to start thinking about these things as early as you can, rather than waiting until a year, year later on in life. Um, the World Economic Forum's platform for shaping the future of health and healthcare is the world's strategic public and private partnership platform to identify and scale up solutions for more resilient, efficient, and equitable healthcare systems to keep populations healthy and to deliver the best care. And to strengthen the global response against the challenges Alzheimer's and dementia presents to millions around the world, the forum initiated the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative, also known as DAC, in 2021. DAC collaborates with organizations worldwide to address core gaps and needs in the understanding of Alzheimer's and dementia, including developing an innovation ecosystem that accelerates breakthroughs, uh, developing and scaling promising solutions, and equipping healthcare systems to end Alzheimer's disease. And what I think is especially um, unique and special about this initiative is that we're focusing on both high income countries and middle and low income countries as dementia can affect anybody, regardless of their economic, racial or geographic status. For those that are already affected with dementia, the priority is really focusing on their physical, their physical health, their mental health, and ensuring that they have the right social care and support systems in place. Uh, many individuals that are diagnosed with, demen with dementia often have other illnesses so you know we're, we're talking about something that's much more complex than just um just a brain disease so while there's still a lot of research out there again on trying to understand how exactly to best tackle this uh, we're still at the point that in the very very early stages oftentimes the best course of action is to make sure you're as healthy as you can be that you have your right support support systems in place and that you have the social needs uh cared for and finally we broke down retirement preparation by ethnicity and race. Let's take a look. Well, obviously, over the past you know several years, but even leading up to that, you know, we've had a, a renewed and increased focus on race in America, on differences by race, inequalities by race. Obviously, dealing with you know social, economic issues, crime issues, but also financial issues. And retirement is one of the, the key uh, financial issues facing households. Say many people are worried about it, and so I was interested in looking at retirement income adequacy by race and looking at differences uh, between whites, blacks, and Hispanics in various aspects of retirement. And the, the, the key parts are, are not controversial. I mean, it's if you look at retirees today, uh, whites have substantially higher savings, substantially higher incomes than blacks and Hispanics do. But the question is, why does that happen? And you know, one explanation is that you know whites are better at saving for retirement than blacks or Hispanics. It doesn't it doesn't mean a you know a moral thing, but it might mean, for instance, uh, less availability of 401ks at jobs that blacks and Hispanics have, less financial education. But another explanation is that blacks and Hispanics are saving you know more or less as they should if you look at the principles of economics, the principles of financial planning. But the differences in retirement income simply reflect the fact that they have different uh, lower incomes during their working years. You know, so they're saving the, you know, the, the right percentage of their income, but their pre-retirement earnings are just a lot lower. So it's trying to look at those issues and, and, and kind of get some answers. But obviously in doing that, it, it raises other issues of how you look at retirement income adequacy, how you measure these kinds of things. I'm in favor of increased uh, financial literacy education. You know, I, th I think the question is, when, you know, when do you do it? Um, you know, some people say just have a year of financial education, financial literacy during high school, that may help, but you may also want to think of how do we make it available to people as they need it throughout their lives. Um, you know, you, you learn about mortgages when you're going to buy a home, you know, you learn about taxes when you start really paying a lot of taxes. So a lot of it is just in time education. I think we want to do what we can on that front. At the same time, you know, the conclusion I came to is the differences in retirement incomes and savings by race are probably not driven heavily by differences in financial literacy. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can find those differences in the data, but I, I think it, it's that's not the major factor we're looking at. I think we're looking at just differences in, in financial ability to save, difference in earnings um, during people's working careers. That's a huge driver of where things end up in old age.
however bad the inequalities are today between races and you you know you can pick whatever measure you want to pick they are are a lot less bad today than they were in the past so you know that doesn't mean we we shouldn't be upset about these things and try to address them but at the same time i i think it's sort of irresponsible when we present that things are just getting worse and worse and worse they're not um the, the really a lot of uh black americans hispanic americans are really succeeding today and and you know achieving the american dream of, of coming in better off or ending up being off, better off than, than your parents or grandparents were so we're making progress and you know i in doing this paper i used a you know pretty sophisticated economic model projecting retirement incomes into the future and i think that uh, at least, you know, based on the best guess is that inequality is going to continue to shrink in the future. But even if you go out two or three decades, it's likely we're still going to see inequality in retirement incomes between blacks, whites and Hispanics. And so partly what I was thinking about is, you know, we're making progress, but where where do these disparities come from? Yeah, I mean, I've favored uh, proposals in the past you know, for the federal government to offer sort of an IRA or 401k type plan to everybody so that, you know, whether your employer offers one or not, you have access to retirement plan at work. I mean, all of us can save in an IRA, but, you know, research has found that people are much more likely to save if they have it at work, somebody can help them sign up. The contributions are automatically deducted from, from their, their paycheck. At the same time, though, I, I think sometimes we overstate, you know, the retirement coverage gap, as it called. You know, sometimes people say, well, half of workers don't have access to a retirement plan at work. A lot of that is bad, based on data, which are not very good. Um, I think the, the better numbers, probably around 70 percent of workers uh, have access to some sort of retirement plan at work. Of the remaining 30%, though, some of them are, to be frank, very low income for whom saving for retirement is not going to be a, a huge priority for them. They're going to get a high replacement rate from Social Security, which means Social Security is going to replace most of their pre-retirement earnings. But you also have issues, say, where uh, one member of a, of a spousal couple will have access, the other won't. You know, the, the, the contribution limits for, for uh, 401ks are pretty high. So even if you, even if one spouse has um, access to retirement plan, the other spouse can sort of piggyback on it. The, the spouse who has the plan contributes more to make up for the fact that the spouse who doesn't um, can't. If you look at IRS data, over 80% of married couples today are actively participating in a retirement plan. Um, and that just shows how you can make that work. So you, we can patch things together and it's not a disaster, but at the same time, there's no reason not to give everybody the chance to do it at work. So I think we want to look at solutions that will provide that to people. In this study, yeah, there's, there, there's this issue where um, essentially rich people live longer than, than poor people. And you know, partly you get differences by race and ethnicity, although those are not straightforward. Um, uh, blacks end up shorter lifespans than whites do, but Hispanics who are often low income, they actually live longer on average than, than whites do. But if you look simply by income, and we've seen this, you know, white working class idea of you know, deaths of despair, things like that, clearly you see that that lower income people tend to survive for a shorter period after retirement than high income people. And yeah, that's a that's not a good thing, obviously. But at the same time, if you're trying to calculate the adequacy of somebody's retirement savings, you do want to have some idea of how long they're actually going to need those savings for. Um, I'm pulling a number out of my head. I did some previous work on this, but I think the the life expectancy, say from beginning at age 65, of somebody who's in the bottom fifth of the income distribution is probably about 20% lower than somebody who's in the top fifth. So all else equal, that, that higher income person is going to need to provide an extra 20% simply to cover the longer lives they have. So these are a lot of things. Most of these studies that say, oh, low income people don't save enough, they don't account for the fact that, you know, realistically, they're not going to live as long. And so they, they you know, you just want to have some idea of what you need to provide for yourself. Well, certainly great segments. I want to thank all of our great contributors this week. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line and don't forget, for all the latest curated news in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more all in one place, and that's key, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content? Well, visit our website and, of course, our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for BRN Sunday. I'll be talking to members of the academic world, financial services, 
and the media as we analyze all the news and events for the week. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.